And don't forget to consider that our busy website gets over 200,000 hits a month. 200,000 hits a month. That's a lot of people to see your advert. There you go. So think about advertising with us, Sound Fusion Radio. The best music. Best music. Worldwide. On Sound Fusion Radio. We're going to pop across now to have a conversation with none other than Kenny Wellington of Beggar & Co. Here we go with that exclusive interview. Bang on 11 o'clock. Hello, yeah, this, that's uh, not bad going, is it? Is that Kenny? Yeah, it's me, yeah. How are you doing? Is that Ian? Yes, yeah, Ian. Yeah, yeah, no, I guess it's, <laughs> well, you know, 11 o'clock, here I am. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Are you well? Yeah, very well, thanks, Ian, yeah. Good, mm-hmm. good. Yeah, very good, thank you, very good. Yeah, I, I wanted to start, Ken, if that's okay, by asking you about you know sort of the very the very sort of beginnings of things, the the light of the world into Beggar and Co kind of uh, evolution, if you like. Uh, I wondered if uh, we could start with that at all. Yeah, that's no worries. Uh, what happened is going back to <laughs> nineteen seventy four. Uh, I can't remember how old he was. I think well, Tubbs was thirteen. Some of us must have been. 14, 15, we used to um, rehearse at the place in uh, Clapton called Ickberg Road. Yeah. Uh, just get together as musicians. I had met um, Breeze, the guitarist, when we used to go to Crackers, which was a club in Wardour Street that ran on Friday afternoons. Mm-hmm. Breeze was there with his uh, big afro dancing around the dance floor. <laughs> and I bumped into him in, in Oxford Street, and I, you know, we just got chatting. And he said he played the guitar, and I was actually a guitarist at that time, but I just started uh, dabbling in the trumpet. Yeah. And I was playing with a band called um, what do you get? the Typical Funky Band (TFB), which later became Central Line. Wow! But uh, Breeze, Breeze had asked me. He said, "Well, we've got a guy with a clarinet." <laughs> which was David Baptiste, who had just bought a saxophone, mm-hmm. and they were thinking of getting a brass section in their band, and if I'd like to come down to Clapton. So I went down. Uh, Breeze was there, myself, David Baptiste, Tubbs on bass, and uh, at the time, a drummer called Junior King. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we started playing, you know, various, various pieces of music. Uh, after a couple of months, we thought we were sounding pretty good, and we thought, well, we, we need a name. <laughs> so uh, because we'd been trying to uh, learn lots of Call in the Gang jamming, Call in the Gang tunes, Bree said, why don't we name ourselves after one of the Call in the Gang albums, Light of Worlds. And we thought, well, yeah, that's all right. What about if we put the uh, the in there and yeah. take the S out? And uh, we decided on calling ourselves Light of the World. <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. See, uh, I, I knew I knew it was worth asking you because you hear so many so many stories. But um, you know, talking to you, Kenny, means we we actually get the real one, which is great, and uh, yeah. and, that, and that's lovely. So, uh, and Light of the World, well, I mean, you know. Such a, a wonderful, a wonderful discography, really. I mean, uh, you know, the, the successes of, uh, you know, London Town. I shot a sheriff. Time. I mean, wonderful tunes. We still get asked for them time and time again. Now, you know, people love them. Yeah. Well, what 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 happened as the story sort of goes on, we were we met a guy called Brent Clark that knew a little bit about the music business, and he started. Uh, getting us gigs and sh- some shows in North London. Yeah. Uh, yeah, pe- people had started getting interested. And then um, Brent decided that... He, 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 what, was, what was Brent doing? I think... Oh, he actually he actually uh, moved. He left the country. So that was a bit of a blow for us. But we met a guy, Joe Williams, a guy that owned a record shop in Seven Sisters Road, mm. where Bluey... Uh, of incognito he was working in the shop at the time uh, when we were rehearsing upstairs Bluey turned up with his guitar and obviously <laughs> he had a wealth of knowledge uh, and we welcomed him obviously into the band yeah. uh, then we decided to start making 
a couple of demos, acetates. Uh, we made we made a rec recording. Joe took us into a studio, and we took it to uh, Joe. In fact, took it down to Ensign Records, where he knew Chris Hill, mm. and they 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 quite liked it, you know. And they and they were sitting there deciding what to do with it. But funnily enough, we went down to Lacey Lady in the next couple of weeks, and we actually gave. This is the guy that actually broke the band. We asked Tom Holland, Big Tom Holland, yeah. if he'd give the record a spin at the Lacey Lady. You know, Tom yeah. did. And the, the people went wild. And they kept asking him, what, what's this? This sounds a bit different. So they played it. He must have played it three, four times in the night. And he said, it's those loud. Oh. I understand about the band, Light of the World, Pegger and Co, all of it. In... in uh, lots of tunes in the charts uh, all over different places. Top 10 genre charts and uh, in the national charts, the pop charts, we, we, we managed to get between us uh, four tunes. Uh, Beggar and Co, Somebody Help Me Out, Mule Chart Number 2, yeah. plus Light of the World, oh. <laughs> Sheriff, and then lots of... Um, you know, jazzy, funky tunes that were on the peripheral, but have lasted the test of time, London Town and, and, and tunes like that. Um, but our ambition, <laughs> our whole, the whole mm. ambition for us was to be on the cover of Blues and Soul magazine well. and to be able to play a gig at Hammers, Hammersmith Odeon where we'd, we'd seen, you know, our heroes playing previously, Cool and the Gang. Uh, in fact, we didn't see Cool and the Gang at Hammersmith we saw them at the Rainbow, yeah. Rainbow Theatre. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah, and, and and it was only ever ever something we thought, you know, well we'll do it for a couple of years, and then most bands don't exist; they cease to exist. We were we were told we'll have a couple of years at this lads. So when we're on stage, and I still see some of the boys now, it, it's unbelievable. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's quite a lot there. Uh, Shall I come to the morphing bit? How how all these bands derived from Light of the World? Yeah, yeah. Just just keep going, Kenny. Loving it. Just just keep telling us all about it because uh, I'm just loving all the information coming straight from you. Yeah. Well, what what initially happened is uh, first of all, after uh, doing the recording, swinging, it came out, and, and bearing in mind what I said just before about what our actual ambitions were yeah uh they'd pressed up uh, a few thousand 12 inch records few thousand seven inch records polygram phonogram actually were, were distributing the record and we put it out there yeah. but un, unbeknown to us uh, and very surprisingly you know it comes to the ears of uh the bbc and we were, we were invited to do top of the pops we thought, oh okay great which we did. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I remember. Yeah, but but the funny the funny thing was, you know, the record we we went on to top of the pubs and swinging. Although it, it sold loads of twelve inch records, it never really became the hit it should be because nobody was prepared for it, and people were going into the shops to buy the record the following week. Mm. It had all been sold out, so we kind of lost the impetus on that one a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, we just didn't expect it. <laughs> didn't have enough press. That was the problem. <laughs> no, no, we, we 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 still sort of laugh laugh about it now. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, it, it progressed. But what happened just before the album release? Actually, Peter Hines and Chris Etty and Peter Hines keyboard playing Chris Etty and percussionist had joined the band, and um, we started. You know, the adventure for us had started, and, and, that, and that just simply meant we weren't, we're no longer just playing in London and around North London. We were doing shows up and down the country. Mm. And uh, one of the gigs, in, we should never have done it really because there was a blizzard, but we managed to get down to Scotland and uh, we, had to, we had to play somewhere else the next day back over in uh, the other side of the country, of England. Yeah. So we had to leave, do an early start to get back. Um, you know, we got caught in this blizzard, and um, then the engine froze over, and we pulled over on the hard shoulder, and we got hit by a juggernaut. Oh God! Yeah, 
And, um, you know, tragic, tragically, it, you know, we lost Chris Etienne because, I mean, where he was sitting, he, he basically took the impact of the accident. Oh. Uh, so we were in disarray for a little while. Yeah. Um, Louis, at that point, you know, he, he couldn't carry on. No. Uh, obviously, we lost Chris and the rest of us decided, well, you know, <laughs> we've just got to get back on the bike, as it were. Yeah. And uh, we auditioned, and then uh, G. Bello came down from Manchester, a nice Afghan coat, I remember. He came down to the record shop, and uh, he said, yeah, he'd heard of us up north, and uh, he auditioned on the percussion, and, he, and, and he, you know, he was really good. Yeah. You know, we liked him, we got along well. So he joined the band, and then there was another guy that used to come into the record shop, and stand around listening to us rehearsing. We'd auditioned a few guitarists, and then he asked if he could have a go. And we yeah. said, yeah, he was a postman at the time. And uh, that was Nat Augustine, you know, who then joined on a guitar. Yeah. And later on, which was, it, it was quite funny, actually, because myself and Bats at that time, we were the brass players playing sax and uh, trumpet. Mm. Sax, Bats, trumpet for me. And after Nat had gigged with us maybe four or five times, I think we wandered into a shop and he, he picked up a trombone and banged out a couple of notes. And we said, oh, we didn't know you could play that. He, and he said he'd learned a bit in the boys' brigade. So uh, we said, well, you, you might, you, you know, we're going to expand the horn section. You can play that as well now. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, and, uh, you know, as it, as it went on, uh, Bluey was still in and around the band and writing and doing stuff like that. And both he and Tubbs, I mean, they were, they were, they were I mean, we, myself, when I say we, myself, Breeze and people, we were really into um, Cool and the Gang, mm -hmm. Fat Back Band and mass production of bands of, of that ilk. Yeah. And at that time, Bluey and Tubbs were listening to uh, Weather Report and bands like that. Mm -hmm. And they decided to do a project, which was the first Incognito album. Yeah. Uh, myself and Breeze, we looked at it and thought, well, that, 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 that's great. So now there's sort of light of the world and Incognito. And we, we were looking at Parliament. We said, you know, it's funny. They've got these bands, Parliament, Funkadelic, and then you've got Bootsy's Rubber Band. Mm. Uh, maybe we should, we should have another off offshoot. <laughs> you know, so we were thinking about it, and we, we, we were writing, we were actually writing for Light of the World at that time, and um, we'd written a track, Somebody Help Me Out, and we sung it to the guys at, on, on the... Uh, in fact, we didn't sing it, we played them a cassette on the way to a gig, really? and a couple of the guys laughed. <laughs> so they said, you, no, well, yeah, well, remember the day well, they said, nah, 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 we're not recording that. We said, well, all right. And we thought, well, you know what? We should do this as the other project. Somebody help me out. Uh, what should we call the band? I can't. Re we were in Whitechapel actually, and we 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 actually came across a homeless person. Nice guy. Mm. Usual, you know. You got. You can you give us a quid, whatever. Yeah. Which we duly did. But it was like a no-brainer. We just said, you know what? <laughs> Beggar and Co. Beggar and Company. <laughs> Brilliant! Isn't that great how that came about? So yeah, so, it's, you know, so um, cost you a quid though. <laughs> yeah, cost us a quid, you know. But hey, we live in the donation. <laughs> That's a little joke. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so we did that. I mean, at that time, at that particular time, all three bands existed alongside each other. So mm. you know, when, when we do shows. We'd go out as light of the world, and it would say featuring Beggar and Co. You know, and we might we'd do an incognito number, uh, one of Tubbs at that time. Yeah. Because uh, Bluey wasn't at, well, he wasn't live with us at that time. It's sort of, um, I think that entity had become his priority, and it, a good decision, Bluey. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, we we were doing all of that. And then the uh, brass section, we started getting asked to do lots of things, doing sessions for all kinds of people. And um, not as a direct result, but the people that you're sort of friends with, you're in a band, 
at that time you start seeing less and less and sometimes they're waiting on you whilst they do other things um myself baps and breeze have kind of been responsible well, not lucky lucky really that the, the singles somebody helped me out mm. time i'm so happy happened to really stem from us um mm. As we, as we were young, obviously other guys wanted to write, and some some would have, you know, four or five of us writing, but when we were thinking about particular kinds of tunes, at that time we had a little bit of dominance, which, you know, I guess to be, to be fair, in retrospect, some of the other guys weren't necessarily happy about, mm. so little cliques would start to form in the band. And uh, we remember, I remember <laughs> we said, you know what, it's best if we all... Um, in fact, I didn't say it, somebody else did, but maybe we should just go and do all of, all of our different projects. And at that point in time, Life of the World was supposed to cease, mm. finish. And uh, by this time, we were being managed by a guy called Mark Howes, who was the son of a great entrepreneur called Arthur Howes. You know, and yeah. Arthur, we went to their house in uh, Devonshire News nice little um, house up in the West End and Arthur looked at us and he, he said, oh. you guys, you, you really should think about what you're doing. You know, you shouldn't break up the band, but, you know, we knew everything. We said, well, it's come to the point where, you know, people are not really talking to each other, cliques and all that. I mean, most bands, if that happened now, you'd probably just say, you know what, let's not do anything for six months. People go off and... Uh, do whatever they're doing and you come back refreshed but we were all young headstrong yeah so um we went off doing what we were doing and mark howes rung us up and he he, he said you know you guys you're doing beggar and co blue is doing incognito um a couple of the guys can't get a can't get a recording deal uh because they haven't got a name you know those those guys were g and nat do you mind if they use the name Light of the World? And, uh, you know, we weren't bothered. We said, yeah, it's fine. And I do, it's, it, you know, we should never have done that. Mm -hmm. I've, got, I've got to be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if we'd have had vision, yeah. we would have said, well, no, you, you know, you, you, you can't use it. We'll use it when we're all ready to use it. Because it's, but you know, you, you it's been, like the world. You know, uh, that's I, I, it. I'm not really. I'm not. I won't. I won't go go too far into it out of respect to to Matt and G. To be honest, but um, just moving moving on. Mm -hmm. So they they recorded an album as Light of the World, um, the Famous Faces album. Yeah, it's a couple of nice tracks. A couple of very good tracks on there. Uh, we went on and recorded a Beggar and Co album. Bluey did all of his stuff. That's right. And then everything went quiet no incognito no light of the world recording no beggar and co recordings mm. and uh nat and g i think g did an album uh it might have been with lonnie simmons if, if i'm correct one of the guys associated with the gap band g had gone off he started a solo career at that time and nat had started a solo career mm. as beggar and co we were mostly doing sessions uh, Bluey was working with a guy called Steve Dante at that time. And come about 1985, uh, myself and Bluey were talking, uh, Breeze actually, were talking about the light of the world situation and went in to see Ensign Records. You know, we were chatting about various things and they said to us, you know, it'd be good if you did a remix of London Town. We can get DJ John Morales uh, in. Nice. to work with you guys so yeah. we said yeah great so we kind of rung rung everybody said look this is what we're doing and uh at the time i, I think it was like a, a an english version of soul train fronted by jeffrey daniels that was on tv at the time yeah. Yeah. and we were offered to go on that so we contacted all the guys and said you know let's do this again time had elapsed and uh yeah. you know we all got on reasonably well we started uh 
recording, doing a few gigs uh, within that G Bellow. I think it was around that time. He also started a band called The Team, did a tune called Wicky Wacky House Party, which went down really well in clubs. Yep, I remember it. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, we were doing Light of the World, and it sort of, it, it was a sort of funny period because over the next few years, we started recording in various <laughs> different configurations. Um, Bluey came back for a recording on Arista that involved Bluey, myself, G Bello, and not too many of the others, which, which you know, to fair play, they weren't too happy about. Mm. Uh, that was a track called One Destination. Just before that was to be released, Bluey signed with Talking Loud. So that sort of, um, although the recording came out, it didn't, didn't really go too far. Yeah. And then once again, it went very, very quiet until 1999, where, uh, you know, I was in touch with some people. And once again, I thought, well, you know, it, it would be really good. Years have gone by. Let's do another album. And we recorded the Inner Voices album, to which everybody was invited. Yeah. Uh, Peter Hines actually he, he couldn't make the album, and um, I think there were one or two things that I remember G asking to see the contract, and I think there were one or two things that he wasn't happy with, so he declined. Uh, yeah. Myself, Breeze, Nat, Nat Augustine, um, David Baptiste, and the then bass player at the time was called Frank Felix, mm. yeah. and a couple of others. We got together with Richard Ball, who had done some fantastic work uh, writing and producing with Bluey. And, uh, you know, I said, well, I was in the production chair at the time, but it would actually be better, you know, to get somebody that's really on top of things. And I was, I was happy to work as a co-producer with Richard Ball, mm -hmm. to which I must, I must say, <laughs> working with Richard Ball, you know, we spent six months on that album and I was, practically working with him most days for six months that guy is a genius just, he's, just he's, so good must have been fantastic Kenny absolutely lovely yeah a fantastic fantastic learning curve <laughs> um, yeah and as it goes on from there so that album was out for a while uh, the band then started playing some gigs in fact at that point G Bello had, uh, had rung up and said that he'd organized a couple of shows, so we started playing again as a band. Um, and then, unfortunately, gradually, I think um, the cliques started to form. You know, I don't, say, I, don't, I don't necessarily say anybody's more responsible than anybody else. It's something we all should have learned. And people gradually, we start, started to... Um, move away from each other yeah myself baps peter hines and breeze all decamped mm. and uh started recording as albums as beggar and co again uh brass strings and things the legacy uh sleeping giants yeah, and great albums yeah yeah and here we are and that's the sort of short synopsis of Light of the World, Beggar and Co and Incognito. There you go. And and that was less than a third of the footage that came out of that interview. Great talking with Kenny Wellington there of Beggar and Co. Well, Light of the World and Incognito, if you hear the story there, because the links between those bands were, were very, very close and uh, they used to sort of swap members, if you like, and... Uh, perform gigs as both and so on so it's very interesting there but there was so much footage that was and it's so good that um, what we decided to do was take the rest of the footage and put together a beggar and co special show 
which will probably be two to three hours, including their music, sections of the interview and where that music fits around it. We we will bring that in. So we're, we're scheduling that to happen in the next fortnight. So watch this space for the rest of that fantastic interview with Kenny Wellington of the iconic Beggar & Co., absolutely amazing Brit funk band, an absolutely amazing story. And judging by the texts that were coming back from people as that interview was going out, um, people were relating to the places in Kenny's uh, conversation there. You know, the clubs he was talking about, the record shop he was talking about, all of that kind of thing. And um, so I think it will be wonderful to put together a full three-hour feature on the band, including the music, and that's what we're going to do. So watch the website, and you'll find out exactly when that's going to be. And uh, it's just been wonderful featuring Beggar & Co. this week. Absolutely fantastic. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we've got the slice of reggae. Glossy. This is Sound Fusion Radio with DJ Gloss. 